Today, I want to show you a classic piece of mathematical trickery that dates back to 1774. I'll show you the trick, then explain why it's so effective, and then reveal a surprising connection to a famous sequence you probably know. Everybody loves a little bit of honky-tonk hogwash after all, except perhaps for George Vaccaro, he's probably had quite enough of the stuff. Here is a square, and surely you know how to find its area, just square the side length. We see that this square is an 8 by 8 square, so to find its area, we just just multiply 8 by 8, which gives us an area of 64 square units. And note that this diagram is to scale, so we don't know what the units are, inches, centimeters, dollars per kilobyte, cents per kilobyte, but it is indeed the case that the ratio of this segment to this one is 5 to 3. And for example, the ratio of this segment to this one is 8 to 3, so it is to scale. Like we said, the area of this square is 64 square units. Of course, its area doesn't change if we move it around or even spin it around. Of course, translating and rotating the square doesn't change the fact that its area is 64 square units. In fact, we can go even further. We could slice and dice the square however we darn well please, and all of the pieces that we cut it into combined would still have that same area of 64 square units. Do these pieces fit together nicely? Well, maybe not, but it doesn't change the fact that I know what their total area is. Certainly we agree on that, so let's rewind and cut this square a little bit more carefully this time. Again, we could cut the square up however we like, and certainly its area is unchanged. Let's try cutting it along the black lines here. All right, so I've cut up the square more thoughtfully, and again, the area of all these pieces together has to be 64 square units. But here is where we get into a little bit of trickery. Uh-oh. As you can see, I have just rearranged the pieces of our square into a beautiful rectangle. Now, let's just make sure we haven't dismembered reality like a hog at a butcher shop and check what the area of this rectangle is. Obviously, it's gonna be 64 four square units, but let's just do the math. We can see that the height of the rectangle is five units, so we'll have the height multiplied by the base length or the width, whatever you want to call it, eight plus five. That's those lengths there, eight plus five. So five times 13. And of course, as we expect, this gives us 60. Oh no. 65? Where did the extra square unit come from? Here is the reassembled figure printed out, just so you can get a more convenient look at all of the dimensions. But point is, we've got trouble. We took a square with an area of 64, sliced and diced it, and rearranged it into a rectangle with an area of 65. If you haven't seen this sort of puzzle before, you might want to take a moment to mull over where this extra square came from. While you do that, let me just give you a touch of history. So far as I can tell, this is the first known example of a so-called vanishing square paradox. This type of paradox has proliferated over time and been given many names based on the authors who have covered it, as well as the ways the paradoxes have been presented. Often this type of paradox is presented with a chocolate chocolate bar. And this earliest example of such a paradox that I'm showing you was created by a fella named William Hooper, who I cannot find any information about whatsoever. Of course, while they're commonly called vanishing square paradoxes, in this first presentation it's more like a materializing square, since the extra square unit, 64 to 65, seemingly comes from nowhere. Hooper published this little puzzle in 1774 in a book he made on recreational pyrotechnics. Uh, in fact, this is the fourth volume. His book contains recreations of all sorts for all audiences and includes a cute appendix, which I suspect is where this puzzle showed up. The appendix contains miscellaneous recreations. The whole book included things like how to create the sound of thunder and how to make fireworks and uh, how to materialize a square, which is the, the coolest part that we're talking about now. 
As for what's going on here, hopefully, even if you've never seen this sort of puzzle before, you can identify which step is shady. Of course, it's true that the area of our square, as given, was 64, and that cutting it into pieces does not change the total area of those pieces. So, of course, the shady step in where the trick lies is reassembling those pieces into a rectangle. Does it look like a perfect rectangle? Yeah, especially for something just hand cut out of papers, it looks pretty darn good. And of course, you can make it look exactly like a rectangle by just making it electronically and saying it's so. However, the math tells us that these pieces do not fit as snugly together as our eyes may tell us. Indeed, the math tells us that these square pieces don't actually fit exactly to make a rectangle, and that although it looks like they make a 5 by 13 rectangle, they are missing one square unit of area. And as it turns out, that missing area is hidden in the diagonal. Well, it might look like everything lines up perfectly to form this rectangle that has an ordinary diagonal, it's not the case. In order for this to be the diagonal of a rectangle, as is claimed in the trick, well, certainly the slope of this piece of the line would have to be the same as the slope of this entire line. Because of course, the diagonal of a rectangle has to be a straight line. It's not a line that cranks in different directions. It has to have the same slope all the way across. Now, what is the slope of this whole line if it's the diagonal of this rectangle? Well, the run is 5 plus 8, and the rise is 5, so rise over run would be 5 over 5 plus 8, or 5 over 13. That's the slope of the whole diagonal, and that should be the slope of any individual piece we look at. But if we look at this piece here, we can easily see that the slope of this piece here is rise over run 3 over 8. 8. And 5 over 13, it turns out, is not equal to 3 over 8. It's close to 3 over 8, but they are not equal. The fact that the slopes are so close is why the trick is difficult to see. The pieces do nearly form a rectangle, but it's not quite so. Now, perhaps the most interesting thing about this is that these numbers are not taken out of nowhere, just a random lucky set of numbers that work out this way. In fact, these numbers come from an infinite sequence that we could use to generate more examples, and we could get bigger numbers from the sequence so that the tiny difference is even harder to see. Yes, after looking closely at the numbers, you may recognize the type of sequence we're talking about. We've got a 3, we've got a 5, we've got an 8, and of course, we've got a 13. These are four consecutive numbers in the famous Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence starts 1, 1, and then each subsequent term is the sum of the previous two. 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on, 8 plus 13 is 21, and we could continue. Now, the Fibonacci sequence, named after the mathematician known as Fibonacci, who found the sequence in relation to a problem concerning very sexually active rabbits. This sequence has many fascinating properties, but one of these properties can be seen when we look at four consecutive numbers from the sequence. Like in our case, the four relevant numbers were 3, 5, 8, and 13. Look what happens when we take the outer two numbers from these four in a row, so 3 and 13, and multiply them. 3 times 13, of course, is 39. Now let's also take the inner two numbers and multiply those together. 5 times 8, that, of course, is 40, which is only 1 away from 3 times 13. And this small difference of 1 is what makes the trick work. Let's write out this equation, that 5 times 8 is equal to 3 times 13 plus 1. Now, to turn this into the comparison of slopes that we were doing before, we just have to do some division. Divide both sides by 8, and divide both sides by 13. Then on the left, we're going to have 5 divided by 13, the 8 was divided away. And on the right, because we're dividing by 8 and 13, we're going to have 3 over 8, the 13 was divided out. But then the 1 is getting divided by both of those things as well, the 8 and the 13. Dividing by 8 and 13 is dividing by 100. 
4. And so we see, yes, these slopes are really close. They're only off by 1 over 104. It's no surprise then that the fact the rectangle isn't perfect is so hard to see, even when we print out the pieces and cut them ourselves. Then of course, the cool thing with the Fibonacci sequence is this property holds for any four consecutive numbers from the sequence. We could look at a smaller example, like these first four numbers over here. The outer pair multiplies to three, the inner pair multiplies to two, a difference of one. If we look at bigger numbers, then if we were to actually print out the puzzle, the error would be even more difficult to detect, because the difference in the slopes would be one divided by an even bigger number. In this case, looking at these four numbers, multiply the outer pair together to get 55, times 13, that's 715, and then multiply the inner two together, 21 times 34, again, you see the difference is one. So that's the origin of the vanishing square paradox, where really it was more of a materializing square paradox introduced by William Hooper in 1774, somewhere in the appendix of his recreational pyrotechnics book. And speaking of fitting stuff together, did you know that this is the optimal way to pack 17 squares? I can't zoom out enough for you to see the whole thing, but I promise you this is a pullover sweater that's available exclusively at mathshin.com, my math fashion brand. Check it out, link in the description, mathshin.com. We've got the optimal packing pullover and a bunch of other awesome math products. And let me know in the comments if you have a favorite variation of the vanishing square paradox. Be sure to subscribe as well for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and unsort the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull a brain, push it all the way through the whole blue planet faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you're so sick.